But in the audience, when I gave my talk, I was talking about um, forming networks and coalitions to be more resilient to disasters. And uh, I was thinking, like, how do we use the systems we have? So I was wondering, you know, well, if you move somewhere, you probably do a change of address form. Maybe we could have like good information about, you know, emergency services and things like a soon in that packet, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the Ikea coupon and other stuff is nice <laughs> too, but like, what about something you want to, you know, keep and put on your fridge? So I was thinking, how, how, how do you deliver and distribute that information? How do you think about, you know, maybe this organization has cots, this organization has floor space. If we need to put them together to like make an emergency temporary shelter, that, that's what we can do. Um, so I talked about that idea and in the audience was actually um, a, like a, a research partner who was on a project at RAND that was doing just that. Mm -hmm. And so he invited me to, you know, talk with the PIs and work with them for the summer um, and interestingly enough I had applied to the summer associate program as a like under the statistics branch they hadn't called me yet but hey it's all right <laughs> this is the public health millennial career stories podcast where you'll hear about diverse career stories career strategies get tips and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey if you want to learn about public health public health careers or just hear public health stories Stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, episode number 37. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Hope that you all are staying well. Happy Black History Month. I hope that you all are taking time just to reflect and do what you need to do to get yourself going. Um, today's episode has lots and lots of value. And I know whoever's interested in like biostats or anything like that, definitely hits up this guest tonight. And other than that, I know that I have a bunch of public health chats that I've planned out for February. So if you have not as yet, definitely check those out on my Instagram page or my LinkedIn group and be sure to register. I am requiring registration this time. So I look forward to chatting with you all then. And uh, let me know if you have anything you want to talk about without further ado. Well, before that, definitely make sure you subscribe, like, share, um, tell a friend about this. I uh, appreciate it. And I hope that you all find this episode as well as the many other episodes very valuable. Without further ado, here's the guest. Today, we have a biostatistician, speaker, and data coach for Black women in public health. She got her Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from Spelman College and then her Master of Science in Biostatistics from UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. This guest has also completed doctoral coursework at Party Rand Graduate School. She has had a plethora of roles throughout her schooling. She's also the founder and consultant for Rose Data Studio. Check her out on LinkedIn and her IG at Rose Data Studio. We have Asia Spears MS. Welcome to the show, Asia. Thanks so much, Amari. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. How are you doing and how have you been coping? Yeah, I'm doing all right. I think uh, winter is tough, you know, having to not have my same activities that I had last winter. I used to go to yoga every week. It was really nice. So I'm just kind of doing it at home. But um, yeah, just enjoying um, the season as best I can. Just glad to be healthy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Definitely yeah. have to be grateful for those uh, little small things in health yeah. is uh, very important. Um, so how do you identify and tell us a little bit about your personal background? Sure. So I identify as a Black woman. I am also a proud HBCU graduate. Um, that is something I definitely, you know, love about um, my background. Um, I'm also a scientist um, in the data world, um, but I don't necessarily call myself a data scientist. Um, and I'm a mom as well, um, married. And I'm also a proud breastfeeding mom. I breastfed my daughter for three years. Um, and that was pretty awesome um, to be able to accomplish that. Yeah, yeah, that, that is awesome. And why don't you call yourself a data scientist? Yeah, great question. So there's there's so much nuance to it, right? There is like biosat, there's analytics, there's data science. I think right now what I'm seeing is that data scientists are considered to be the ones who are running machine learning models and setting things up, you know, in that way. Um, and I, I know those algorithms, you know, we covered them in class, but there's this next level of like putting a model into production so it can be making continuous predictions. And I do not do that. 
So I, I see, and the, the way I work is more kind of in the study design, you know, realms, thinking about, you know, publishing papers, studying hypotheses, um, looking kind of more, sometimes more retrospective, right? Where as predictive models are more prospective. So that's kind of how I see the difference between biostats and data science, but there's yeah. definitely a lot of overlap. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, distinguishing that for me. Yeah. Uh, so what does public health mean to you? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I, I see it as all encompassing. And I think that's why when I first learned about it, I was like, this is, this is for me. Um, I actually switched from pre-med to public health because I saw, you know, the, I guess it was that, um, that diagram of, you know, the, the um, kind of downstream effects. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. people are falling off the bridge. Like, let's fix the bridge. Let's mm -hmm. fix the pathways. Like, I'm all about that. And yes, there's going to be people like in the river and with their nets and all that, getting them out. Um, but I want to be, I'm very much an upstreamist type of thinker. Uh, so I think that has always stuck with me um, as, you know, what, what is public health is just enhancing the infrastructure so that we can reduce the incidence of all these things occurring that we don't want to see. Yeah, absolutely. So you said you, you were a pre-med major? I was, yeah, I was a bio major. <laughs> okay, I thought you were a math major, is that? Yeah, eventually, right? So I think <laughs> my spring of my freshman year, I went, I remember I had to go to, <laughs> to the registrar's office with my little paper and like turn it in and let them know I was ready to change, change majors, yep. Okay, okay. So you got your Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from mm -hmm. Spelman College. Um, so what was your thought process, I guess, going in as a pre-med major? Or did you go in as a pre-med major into school? Yeah, I was biology pre-med. And uh, it was so interesting. I think pretty much everyone in my intro to bio class wanted to be a pediatrician, like mm. maybe 90% of us. <laughs> so I think we just needed to be exposed to, to other things. Um, but my pre-freshman summer actually did a program for people, you know, for students interested in STEM, especially in the health sciences area. And I, that's when I learned about public health. And I said, this has to be a part of, you know, what I'm doing. Um, some, you know, so I figured maybe I would minor in public health eventually, or maybe get an MPH with my MD. Um, but I think once I saw and really started to think about the power of numbers and realized I, I love math. And there's biostatistics, I can kind of do both. Um, and I don't have to go to med school, I can support, you know, the, the clinicians and everyone else to really understand what's happening with the data, um, so that they can do their best work. Um, so it kind of evolved over time um, to, to really, you know, as I discovered more of what I was interested in, I realized that I could do something different, you know, I could still enjoy and support the med school folks, but I didn't have to go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Fair enough. So you were in a program called Health Career Opportunity Program Summer Science Internship. So how do you get this and what was this? Yeah, so that was the, uh, yeah, the HCOP Scholar. So that was uh, the um, like pre-summer program. So I think they just sent out, I think I remember just getting a letter, maybe they kind of like seen your GPA and maybe I put that I was interested in biology or I think even biochemistry at the time, you know, so they're like, well, you're in the realm. You said you have this healthcare interest. So they kind of pre-screened you um, and sent out this offer letter um, to say, hey, are you interested in this program? And so I said, yes. And then I think it was the weekend after I graduated from high school, we like drove down to Georgia <laughs> and straight into the program. Okay, that's awesome. That, that's cool that uh, they reached out to you and, and gave you that opportunity. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was a fun, it was a fun summer. And uh, we took, you know, biology classes, calculus. Uh, we got panels of speakers come from like people, pharmacists, dentists, pedi the pediatricians were there, you know, uh, we had a little bit of everything. Uh, we also went to Meharry Medical College on like a, mm -hmm. a tour. So that was, it was, it was really, it was great. It was great to be a part of it. Um, and then we actually had uh, Dr. Bill Jenkins was our epi teacher. Mm -hmm. So that was really powerful. It's kind of like the things you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, he's a legend. Like what? So, um, and so he, he, you know, showed me, you know, showed us the first time I had seen graphs of health disparities. That mm -hmm. was like, that was when I saw them. Um, so that definitely left an, an impact on me. 
Okay. And was this program, is this program before undergrad or is it after like your freshman year? Or how does that work? Yeah, this is the summer in between like high school graduation and your freshman year. Okay, so, so I think it was like six or eight weeks, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was with a bunch of other um, seniors from high school? Yep. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, awesome. so we had, and we were kind of combined. So they had like a Morehouse and Spelman students, like all of us um, were in classes together. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, a good time. And did, did you um, always want to go to HBCU? Yeah, great question. So I considered, I kind of considered every school, like I had applied to MIT, which is somewhere I almost went. And then I applied to Spelman. And I went on an HBCU tour. But I guess out of all the schools I looked at, like Spelman was it for me. Like I got out, we were on campus, and I saw the Science Center. I was like, oh, I'm going to be in there, you know, if I go here. Um, so I chose Spelman. And then um, had a bunch of other options, but the two that kind of were at the end for me were MIT and Spelman. So yeah, I am, I'm so glad I went. It wasn't, it was so interesting because I actually didn't really know much about Spelman until I went to a, um, a college fair mm -hmm. and I saw, I don't even, again, I don't know what it was that pulled me. It's like the Spelman mystique. I know there's the Morehouse mystique, but it was something <laughs> about the Spelman spirit, I think, that just kind of got me. And I was like a women's college, like I didn't, had never said I would do that um, mm -hmm. but I think it was just that moment you you get to campus and then you just something happens you can just tell that that's the place for you um, the other place I considered because I was like, super like focused on sciences um, I think it, it's like the Philadelphia College of Sciences or something I think it might have a slightly different name now um, but I was like yeah I'm such a STEM person I should <laughs> go here and I remember going on the tour and I was <laughs> I, I'm laughing now because I'm like, I'm a nerd, but I was like, I don't know. These are a bunch of like, I don't know if this is going to be my campus. <laughs> um, so it was really interesting just getting a flavor of different institutions um, and just kind of figuring out, you know, what, what might be the best fit for me or what could be a good fit for me. There's always different options. Um, so yeah, those are kind of my most memorable college tours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's awesome. That, that's cool that uh, you felt a pull to to the, I guess, institution, and I guess you you don't you don't um, regret it now. So that's always a good thing. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. And uh, you were a math lab tutor at Spelman College. So mm -hmm. when when in uh, your undergrad were you this math lab tutor? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I almost can't even remember because it was so. <laughs> like in a way it was kind of just chill I was like oh I'm gonna sit here and people are gonna come ask me math questions it didn't even feel like a job <laughs> to be honest <laughs> but I think it, it must have been after I was a math major so I'd say sophomore maybe sometime through senior year you know just kind of depending um I would say I probably I don't know if I was doing it like right before I graduated um how you know I have a lot going on then but um, yeah, it was, that was a great job. <laughs> you just get paid to sit there and people will come in and bring their textbook. I, I love that job. <laughs> so what, what, uh, what types of math classes was that for? Yeah. So anything from college algebra up to, I mean, up to anything I had taken. So, um, like Calc three, um, I did not take differential equations. Those <laughs> things I still can't interpret. Um, so pretty much everything. And then I think there was like a general statistics class that people would come in for help with that as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. That was fun. That's cool. And was there anything more to you switching from uh, your pre-med to math um, other than you just knowing that you can support, um, I guess, physicians at the point in time in a different way? Yeah, um, I think, honestly, I didn't want to memorize the Krebs cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Like we were in the study group, so I think this is, you know, spring semester. So I had gone through the first biology. I was like, okay, this isn't too bad. And then we're in the next one. I'm just like, I see this circle with all these things coming off of it. And I'm like, I'd rather do trigonometry. Like, no, thank you. <laughs> like, I was like, y'all go on and memorize these things. I'll see you on the other side, you know, when you have your data and we can work together then. I, I just didn't want to. <laughs> And for me, I think I'm very, actually, we, we were doing um, like just, um, uh, what are they called? Like evaluations or kind of self assessments this week mm -hmm. at work about what type of learning learner you are. And I'm very visual and kinesthetic. So I need to be writing out and solving a problem. I think for me, writing out the Krebs cycle feels like I'm just, you know, how you go on punishment. Sometimes you have to write <laughs> out, you know, all the things. <laughs> 
it's like, I will not do this or whatever. And I'm like, no, I think for me in the math, in a math problem, it's like this discovery, like you're going to get at the end and solve for X. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't wait to get to the end versus Mm -hmm. like, okay, I got to the end. Oh no, I missed this compound or that, you know, reaction. I'll have to do it again versus (laughs) like, I'm just going to solve this this problem and be done with it. Right. You might get Mm -hmm. stuck and have to kind of rework it. Um, but for me, it just, I guess, just the learning process and the way math was, like the way math is, it just was a better fit for me, like overall. And there might be some great ways to like teach yourself biology and all of that. And maybe I could, you know, if I wanted to go back, somebody can help me with that. Um, but at the time I just said, well, I'm taking calculus and that's going great. Like, let's just keep that up. See, I didn't even know. I was like, I don't know what the next math classes are, but let's go and find out. Yeah. And I I think that's a good way to do it because sometimes we don't even know like what what we're good at. And then when we are good at something, I feel like we should continue to explore that and build on that skill. And then we can always pivot to something else afterwards, if anything. Um, I love pivots. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's it's, it's so essential. It's like just on the talk, just go, just start, you know, you can always change. I think so, because we even had to make like a four year plan. um, And I think people get really stuck with that. They're like, oh, but I might not graduate in four years. And, you know, it's I think you you have to kind of, you know, have like the four year vision, but Mm. then you make maybe just the semester plan or like the year plan. Um, And so I think it's much more nuanced than that. And so I hope, you know, overall, it's a I think it's tough for for students these days. I know um, for some um, classmates I have who do, or colleagues I have who are doing like career counseling and advising for students, they're seeing it. And I'm wondering how does all this, you know, students coming out of this environment where you're taking all these standardized tests and you're like, so focus on GPA and all these Mm -hmm. things. And you're like, gotta stick to these plans and these study guides. And then like real life happens and there's no, there's none of that. (laughs) You have to kind of just intuit your way through some things sometimes. So, um, so I'm definitely, you know, and continue to grow in doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like uh, education kind of fails in in that sense. And then to another point, it's it's kind of tough going to school and starting at such a young age and knowing what you want to do, like when you Mm -hmm. have no experience of what it actually takes to do what you want to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think it's great to be able to explore early, but actually this is, I'm like, this goes back to my, my favorite book, uh, Range by David Epstein. And he just talks about how some of the most prolific, you know, just, let's see, he goes into almost any industry, but if you look at even like athletes, um, some of the most prolific ones, they started out just sampling around in different spaces, different sports until they found what they really loved and where they could really excel. And they just like dove deeper into that. Um, But I think even back from when I was in high school and doing, you know, cross country, sometimes we would do weight training, sometimes we would do Pilates, like you, you know, cross train, try different things, um, strengthen different muscles, have them work together in different ways so you can make new connections. Um, And so that's what I, that's something I really enjoy. And I think um, I want to just keep focusing on, you know, how do I pull in exciting ideas and useful concepts from different domains um, to make something new in my own space, so. Um, but I don't, I don't know, uh, I guess, besides the independent major at a school, like, where do you get, you know, kind of, you know, paid or just have that time and support to, to do that. So I try to build it into my professional development now. Yeah, and that, that is good. And like, I, I was watching a, a video, I feel like this is very tangential from your yeah. story. But anyway, <laughs> I was watching okay. a, a video. <laughs> um, I think I think it was Cal Newport. And he was talking about the, the same similar like to range, like, he looked yeah. at a bunch of people that were super successful. And it's not that they were passionate about the thing that they were successful um, with at, at the beginning is that they were good at it or good enough that they kept going and they just kept getting better and better and incrementally better and then as they got to be excellent they became passionate about it you know so mm-hmm. that that's just an interesting thing to to think about mm-hmm. but anyway Absolutely. back to your story and i will definitely <laughs> have to check out that book um yes. so you are undergrad honors research scholars at the national institute institute of mental health uh, mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about that Sure, yeah. So we had the NIMCOR um, training grant. So the core stood for career opportunities and research. And through that, uh, through my junior and senior year, 
I got exposed to just translational research in the mental health space. So thinking about, you know, and actually a lot of my colleagues in that program were psychology majors. I think we had one sociology, I was the only math person. Um, but again, learning how, how do I support with data and statistics, the work that we're doing. So I love that it was like an interdisciplinary like collaborative um, of us. So um, yeah, that was, that was a great opportunity. So we um, met weekly, you know, talked about different, we learned about different research methods, kind of did um, like a journal club together. And uh, we did, that was actually, that was the one time I used SPSS. I learned a little bit about that um, during the, I think spring of my, um, I just don't remember if it was maybe junior year or senior year. Uh, so we, you know, got to work with some data as well. Um, and then just support each other going to conferences. I think we went to the Abercams conference. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I think we went to that both years. So yeah, it was, it was a great experience. And I think too, just seeing how other people, you know, work within the same domain, but so differently with their different mm -hmm. skill sets. Um, one really cool thing uh, was the three of us actually from the program. So there was actually another math major my second year. So we both went and then another psychology major. We all went to this biostats summer program at Columbia. Um, so I guess that's where I got, you know, in, you know, seeing other schools actually was fun. That was um, my summer program. So I think we'll talk more about that later. But um, yeah, they just always encouraged us through the NIMCOR to do summer programs, to get more research training, to really think about graduate school and the areas we would focus on. Uh, so it was really a great supportive community. Um, and then the program actually ended, my goodness, I guess it was about seven years ago now. Mm -hmm. So we all went back for like this big reunion. Um, and I also do a little photography on the side. So I took pictures for the whole event. Um, it was really great to see everyone, but students who were there and, you know, from the very beginning and like our, the photo of our PI, like submitting the first proposal for the program to get it kicked off. So uh, yeah, that was, it was a wonderful opportunity. Okay, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, other tangential question, what uh, yeah. kind of camera do you use? Oh, I'm a Nikon. Okay. What about, oh, I'm like, are I, you in? Like, not as yet. I'm, I'm still okay. researching and, and deciding, okay. but I will let you all know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I'll I, accept I, you no matter what. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. But it, it, I feel yeah. like it's just so interesting to hear photographers talk about, okay, okay. I'm a Canon. I got I to gotta stick with this. <laughs> like, I can't do anything else. Yes, absolutely. Um, no, and I know some people are like getting back into film now. And then there's the mirrorless mm. cameras. There's a lot of options out there. It's fun. It's, I think for me, it's just like another like science project to kind of figure it out. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so after this, you got your master's of science in biostatistics mm -hmm. from UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. So mm -hmm. how, how did you think about getting your master's in biostats? Yeah, so at the time, I actually was in a PhD program for biostat. So um, my intention was to get the PhD. However, along the way, I just started exploring again. I was like, okay, well, there's this like five or six year, like go straight through and get the PhD. So I was like, oh, look at Epi, look at community health sciences. I, you know, just started kind of making friends in other departments. And, um, you know, I think again, going back to that big, kind of the big tent idea of public health, it's like, well, we're all here to work together. Like, mm -hmm. I want to see what everybody else has going on. Uh, so about, goodness, I guess it was, during my second year, I just decided to take the master's exam with everybody else because I was in I was in classes with them. I figured why not, you know, just get it along the way. Um, so I took that, and they told me that I like passed at the master's level, but not the doctorate level. And I was like, oh, I didn't know we were doing that with the doc with the master's exam. But okay, I thought I was, thought that was for later. So they're like, oh, you're gonna need to take it again. I was like, ah, oh, I guess fine, you know, I'll, I'll try it, but. Um, you know, I think, and, you know, we basically the process of kind of going through and kind of hitting up against these, these like barriers, it made me realize like, well, do I want this? And I think, you know, every PhD student has this like moment, right, where you're like, okay, this proposal from my, you know, perspective, like didn't get, you know, I came back with notes for the third time, like, am mm -hmm. I going to do this? And I think I just said for me, okay, what else is interesting to me? Like, yeah, I can set up to study for this again, but I can also look at other things and kind of figure out um, what I want to do. So yeah, I just, again, just kept exploring to see like what would be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 
is how how does that transition work saying that you were in the phd program and and then mm-hmm. like you didn't pass i guess you didn't pass the exam up to there what, whatever yeah. they wanted and so right. yeah how's that work yeah so you, you know, you're still in the program they're just like oh just try again i'm like oh gosh okay <laughs> like i'll try again <laughs> so i think i did i think i went back at the so we took the exam in may and then I actually was, I had a whole summer internship and they were like, oh, we're giving the exam in September. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to be working till the end of <laughs> August. We'll try to make this work somehow. <laughs> you know, so like you have another chance, right? Because these things, they usually only come up a couple times a year, right? Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, if I don't take it in September, I have to wait till next May again, maybe, or next September, whenever they do it. So I said, okay, I will try again. So I did, you know, I finished my program. I think I took a trip to San Diego for the weekend Then I came back and was like, now I have to study. Um, So I think I had about two weeks and went and did it again. And I think the same thing, pretty much the same thing happened, like master's pass, no doctoral pass. And um, so that summer though, I had actually gone to RAND to do an internship and it was really, really wonderful. I was like, well, like I did great work here and I didn't need a PhD in biostat to do it. So I think that also started just showing me like you can, you know, you have different domains that you can be stronger in or weaker in. Maybe you have to work harder in one space. And if that's really worth it to you, you can go and put, put that time and put that effort in. Um, but it's like, you know, it's your life. You can choose your own adventure. Um, so I think at that point I said, okay, well, let me like try to double down. So I did, I said, let me kind of recommit to getting this PhD. I, the next summer, um, I took a, um, what is it? Field analysis math class. Um, I think it was like math 60 or something. Uh, so I took that with, uh, this, uh, professor who like had written, written his own book for the class. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh. And you know, these, these are the math books where it's like all text and proof. <laughs> I was like, I got to do this to get the measure theory part of the PhD of Biostat, right? Because that's mm-hmm. the class that was coming up. And I said, okay. So I, I went, I did that for the summer. It was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, got through it. And then the exam was coming up again, like the next September. So I think about, I want to say a week or two out, I just went to my advisor. I was just like, I don't want to do this right now. I don't think this is the next, the next best step for me. And I thought about it a while. I thought about my experience at RAND. I thought about, you know, all the TA and tutoring I had done. I was like, you know, I think I want something different and that's perfectly fine. And so thankfully he was really supportive and, you know, I was able to kind of spend the rest of that time. Um, finishing up like all the rest of the requirements for my master's degree and then applying um, to my next program okay that's awesome and and that goes back to to the point earlier that you're saying like you got to just go and pivot as as you go and so that's awesome there absolutely um so you had a position in your when you were doing your master's as a summer associate at rand corporation so how did you get this and what did you do yeah so this is kind of again like paying attention to what um what was really fun actually. So um, back in, let's see, this is my second year of my master's. So, or second year of my UCLA experience. Uh, And so I was uh, participating in this program. It was a speaking competition on like big public health ideas. And so you write a one page paper on like your idea for addressing this topic. And the challenge that year was emergency preparedness. Uh, and so I was really excited. So um, I wrote and I like won at the biostat departmental level. And so I actually got to go pitch my idea um, in front of this panel um, to try to win even more money. Um, and actually, fun fact, I used my winnings from the biostat like departmental level to buy my camera. Um, so that was actually a great way to kind of kick, kick off that part of my creativity. Um, but in the audience, when I gave my talk, I was talking about Um, forming networks and coalitions to be more resilient to disasters. And uh, I was thinking like, how do we use the systems we have? So I was wondering, you know, well, if you move somewhere, you probably do a change of address form. Maybe we could have like good information about, you know, emergency services and things like assume in that packet, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, the Ikea coupon and other stuff is nice (laughs) too, but like, what about something you want to, you know, keep and put on your fridge? So I was thinking, how, how, how do you deliver and distribute that information? How do you think about, you know, maybe 
this organization has cots, this organization has floor space. If we need to put them together to like make an emergency temporary shelter, that, that's what we can do. Um, so I talked about that idea and in the audience was actually um, a, like a, a research partner who was on a project at RAND that was doing just that. And so he invited me to, you know, talk with the PIs and work with them for the summer. Um, and interestingly enough, I had applied to the summer associate program as a like under the statistics branch. They hadn't called me yet, but hey, it's all right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, yeah. So I think that too, right? So just recognizing, and I, I did actually, I went to a few of the statistics meetings when I was there, like they were all great and wonderful, but I just realized for me, like sitting down and talking through like the methods it's not what I want to spend most of my time on. I want to spend more time actually sharing this data back to the community, which I did get a chance to do um, at RAND. So I think it was just a great, you know, I was excited. I couldn't wait for that speaking competition to come up again. I, my, one of my friends had done it last year and I was like, oh, I want to do it. So I'm really glad it all kind of aligned in that way. That was awesome. And I feel like those kinds of things are what are so valuable in like your master's programs, doing those speaking competitions or case competitions, whatever mm -hmm. the case might be, because it really challenges you to, to use what, you, what you've learned in a creative way to solve an actual problem. And I feel like we need to do more of that in education. I don't mm -hmm. know. That's just my thoughts. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's it's super valuable. And you, I think we only have like five minutes to do it, right? So yeah. you have to get like very specific about, you know, what the challenge is, what the gap looks like and how you're going to propose to fill it and why this would be effective. So, yeah. Absolutely. And then you were a coordinator of equity, inclusion and diversity at UCLA. Yes. Um, so how, how did you get this position? Yeah, that was so much fun. So that was after my first year. Um, and I just recognized that, well, especially going from an HBCU to a predominantly white institution, right, there was always, there was already like a kind of a shock. Um, and funny story, uh, my first year, I remember it was, I don't even know how I ran into them, but uh, there was actually a, a graduate school tour from Morehouse and some of my professors who I had worked with for the research training program, they were there and I'm like, what are you doing on campus? This is insane. <laughs> and I remember seeing them and I was like, just so overwhelmed because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't ever see this many black people on campus like, on a regular <laughs> basis. And like, I really miss it. And this was just like, what, like seven months in, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so it was, it was so great to see them, but it reminded me, I'm like, wow, like I had such a great thing like in undergrad mm -hmm. and the support and just kind of knowing things, knowing you're, you're supported, knowing kind of who to go to, having that community, it was almost just like built into almost everything that you did. I said, well, I know it's important to foster that across the entire campus community. And so um, this opportunity came up and it was hosted through the Graduate Student Resource Center, which was a place I went all the time. I think I was probably on my way there when I saw the campus tour, um, because it was just a great, you know, you can come in and just sit and do your homework or work on the computers or talk to the director. And she was fantastic. So I really loved working with her. Uh, and so I applied and actually two of us got selected. So I was working with another grad student who was in sociology at the time. So that was another great opportunity just to connect. And then we had a whole committee of people um, from all over campus, which was a blast. And for me, again, that was it. It was just like all of us coming together from different, you know, North and South campus, like the, the South campus is more of like the, like biomedical and, you know, the school of public health, dental school and med school. And then the North campus was more of like the arts, and, you know, the social sciences uh, kind of thing. But I'm like, look, we're all here together. Let's, let's all make this, you know, a great experience. Um, and so that was fun. So that summer, yeah, I did that part-time. And then I also TA for a class um, for intro to biostat as well. Okay, so you didn't talk a little bit about your intro to biostats TA. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that was that was my class. I did that every single <laughs> every single quarter. Um, so either intro to biostat like part one or part two, so 100A or 100B. And I I loved it because it was I guess that's when I first realized that I was like this quote unquote data translator, which is you know I think more so now becoming a term, but. At the time, I just knew I liked helping it make sense to people who were starting out and helping them understand like, what is data doing? I'm typing this, I don't see anything. I'm like, okay, let's check your data set. And you know, just kind of walking them through how data thinks about data, um, what the 
you know, the methodology is and the, you know, the kind of the nuances of, of doing the calculations, all of that. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. I did. And then I would say, yeah, just starting out, it was a good fit for me. Okay, that's good to hear. So then you graduated and you got a position as an assistant statistician at UCLA mm-hmm. Center for Health uh, Advance- Advancement. Yeah. So how, how did you get this position and what do you do? Yes, well, it's funny. I got that position because I went to our director of communications at the fielding school and I told her I wanted to help like take pictures for events for the summer. And she was like, no, 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 you're going to work with this professor. <laughs> <laughs> she was like I have a project and I guess that's a really cool thing right it's just like she's the communication director she literally knows about all the press and everything kind of Mm -hmm. coming out of school so she she's very well informed about the portfolio of projects we had going on so actually it kind of ended up being you know a great thing even though it wasn't exactly what I asked for (laughs) Um, but it was it was great so I guess that's just another kind of point about just like networking and who you know and who you talk with I used to just kind of stop by the office and just say Mm -hmm. hi and so um, I think that you know that also made a difference just like having that relationship um, and you know in place for her to actually think hey actually I know what your skills are I know what this project needs uh, because the center was just getting started uh, and so she um, connected me I had an informational meeting and I was like you know I think this could be a good fit so then we went forward yeah awesome and then what kind of work did you do in, in this position yeah, so this is a really interesting role because um, it's more about kind of like information management. Um, and it, again, something I didn't really know too much about at the time, but the goal was that, you know, we had this um, model built up in Excel and the whole idea was for it to kind of, you know, get information about different jurisdictions to say like Los Angeles County. And then we say, hey, what if we did universal preschool in Los Angeles County? What do we think would be the downstream effects? And everything was built and put together in Excel and they wanted it to be built into R. And I said, okay, this is not really about statistical methods. This is about understanding how does Excel see data and how does R see data and what are the connections and what are, how do I translate that over into another software? Um, so I went, I was actually at the, uh, <laughs> the statistics consulting. I was like, okay, this, you know, I have this line of code in Excel and here's the things I'm thinking for R, like, how do we put this together? Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time I was like, this just feels odd. Like why, you know, this is a project. I am a statistician and it is working with data, but it's just a little bit different. It has a different flavor to it. Um, but it was a good learning experience, right? Like you, you rec- and then now I recognize all the time people are switching from one software to another Mm -hmm. or something is, you know, not supported anymore. This new tool came out. And so you have to shift, you have to understand the structure well enough to be able to bring it over to something else. Um, So I spent just a lot of time mapping out everything. I said, okay, for this, you know, this um, intervention, here's everything we have, here's all the data tables. Um, So again, really into the information management side of things, but I didn't even know to call it that at the time. Okay, that's, that's, that's quite fascinating, actually. How, how, what does that data look like, um, just generally speaking? Yeah, yeah. So I think we had some American Community Survey, like tables were part okay. of it. Mm-hmm. And then um, what else? I think, oh, yeah, so then just data from studies. So if there was a study that was done on universal preschool, they, we basically kind of um, extrapolated those numbers and then applied them to our data sets essentially so you kind of have like the input like the population you're working on and then like the effect or the program then you kind of apply it to them and then you have the output numbers as well okay awesome thank you for that um and then after this you got some um doctoral coursework at party ran graduate school so what was the thought process for going through this yeah, so at the time I decided, you know, I had a great experience at RAND. Um, I was thinking through, yeah, I don't think I'm right. I want to take this, you know, qualifying exam again for Biostat. Um, and oh, yeah, by the way, RAND has a PhD program, which I, I didn't learn until my first day of being a summer associate when I got off the bus and I was walking and it's like one wing of the building and has a name on it. I was like, oh, I did not know this was here. <laughs> Um, So it kind of was always in the back of my head. I think I probably looked on the website and actually I knew um, one of the um, 
the deans of the school because he was actually the summer associate program director and he was great. Uh, so I was like, well, I could probably just talk to him about it and learn more and go on the website. Um, and so I did an informational session and I was like, wow, this is great. I you know, can still bring in the st statistics, but we're also just looking at kind of you know, different problems in all of society. I could still focus on health, but I could also maybe move into education. Um, so I think it's just kind of like that they talk about almost being in a candy store, like an intellectual candy store. There's so many great seminars to go to. You never have time to go to all of them. Um, but I just felt like, okay, well, if I am still going to, you know, focus on like this doctoral level training, then here's, you know, here's a great place for me to work on that. Okay, awesome. Um, so, so is, is it that you did the PhD? What's, what's the difference between doctoral coursework versus a PhD? And how do you go about trying to get doctoral coursework? Can you go to any, any PhD program and say, I just want to do doctoral yeah. coursework? I would say the way you do that is you go through the courses, you take your qualifying exams, and then you take a leave of absence, which is what I did. <laughs> so, yeah. So I don't think they just, you know, have anybody coming through, right? I think, I guess I've seen maybe for some, um, for some master's programs, you can take like kind of a pre- prerequisite set of courses through a certificate and then have those transfer. Yeah, but for doctoral training, yes. Yeah, so I got through classes. I did pass qualifying exams. So that was awesome. Um, and only had to do them once. That was a relief. It was an intense week though. Um, and then I got through, so I guess this kind of came, it came up again where I was like, I have so many interests. I was interested in institutional research. I was interested in kind of the I started actually getting into math education, statistics education as well. Um, and then there's still like community-based participatory research. I was doing survey analysis. I was like, oh my gosh, there's too many, <laughs> there's too many methods, there's too many problems to solve. Um, and so I knew, especially coming down, you know, after your third year, fourth year, it's like you have to start kind of really narrowing in on like which conferences are you going to, where do you want to publish, and all of those things. And I just didn't have like great answers for that at the time. Um, and I also had a newborn and I said, you know what, I'm going to focus on being a mom right now and then we'll just kind of see what happens next. So it's still kind of an open story, you know, how they'll say like, what's next on Dragon Ball Z? Like, is she going to go back? Is she going to stay here? Like, we have no idea. <laughs> so I think it's still kind of an open question right now for me, but um, everyone's been really supportive. You know, I kind of talk to the dean at least once a year, um, just kind of like where I'm at, what I'm thinking. Um, so we'll see. I think I think it's also, you know, recognizing like you can do many things and I can do many things with like the skill set that I have. So we shall see. I'm continuing to explore. It's never over, right? Yeah, and I, I like that mindset a lot because I feel like we think I, nothing in life is static I feel like and everything mm -hmm. is always changing and revolving our interests change our lives change and our interests right. change because our lives change different things happen so just definitely just having that open mindset and being willing to accept that what I wanted two years ago might be the same thing that I wanted a year ago and that I'm, I'm open to change and opportunities so, so that, that, that is awesome um what, what sorts of coursework did you do yeah, we did, let's see, there was economics, so micro and macro, which macro was not my thing, but I got through it. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, our statistics courses, as well as econometrics, which was different uh, for me as well. And it's, un it's so interesting because some of the same ideas or concepts you would have in statistics would be talked about differently in econometrics. So that was really like, just very, very interesting to just have that dynamic. Um, but when you're thinking about, you know, doing observational studies and working with data, it's just, it's a very, you know, they have their own method, just like Epi is very specific about how they do things. So I kind of recognize that as just, you know, being, you know, almost like an outsider just in this field for a little bit while I was in the course. Uh, and then I had um, all my electives. So, oh, but I will say also in the core courses, we focused on uh, social and behavioral sciences. So we had, uh, I think, a sociologist, psychologist, anthropologist. And there was one more, um, I think there were four. And so they kind of rotated through with different lectures, uh, just kind of talking about like their methodology, their perspectives. So um, we learned about ethnography. We talked more about like case studies, but I say those two things are still kind of foreign to me a little bit, right? Like, mm -hmm. How do you do a good case study? Like, how do you know when you're done? Like when I do my analysis, then I get to the end of my p-value. So it's kind of that same 
think like way of thinking, right? Um, so uh, we did those courses. We um, then my electives, I focused a lot on survey analysis, survey design. Um, I did a propensity score matching course. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, those were kind of the bulk of, of what I did while I was there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what is uh, something that that uh, you think people make a mistake with on surveys typically that you think should be should not mm, be a mistake? That's a good question. I think I think I, I don't know how much I would say it's a mistake, but I guess it's like how do you even judge it sometimes? But how long people how long it requires to take a <laughs> survey? Sometimes people just don't even put that. <laughs> so then maybe and maybe it's because you don't know. So I'm like, are there some great ways? So I think I would just love to see that on more surveys, um, especially the ones where I'm like, yeah, 30 minutes. No, I don't want to do that. You know, and like just go to the next email <laughs> um, to really give people that that choice. Um, and then I would say the other things that bother me is just like, I guess I get to be a stickler for some things about like, you know, proofreading the questions and like <laughs> making sure all the skip logic is working, like just having like a robust test, I would say, um, to make sure that, you know, the experience is smooth um, and that you kind of think through the logic. So I guess this is where my math comes in, right? The logic of when you're giving me answers, are they, you know, covering the whole field or not? Do we need to have an alternative? Um, and then I think too, sometimes people might be, it, de it depends, right? But I guess it depends what you're trying to gather. Um, but I did a survey actually today and someone was asking about, um, you know, if I'm making a module for a class, you know, which things would you want me to cover? And I picked two and I tried to hit next. And she's like, oh no, you have to pick three. And I'm like, I don't have a third one. <laughs> like now you're forcing me to pick a third one. I just don't have a third one. So I think I just clicked other and like wrote non-applicable or something. <laughs> you know, so I, I think things like that where I, I kind of get it, it, it kind of ends up being like math for me, right? It's like the probability of this thing or that coming out and Venn diagrams and things that people might think. So I, I really tend to think a lot through those things. Um, so I just wish more people did. But I know a lot of the times these are kind of like the, like the out at the fray, like tidying up the edges type of things. Cause you have your questions, right? You have all the things you want to ask about. Um, but I think the logic and the, so this is kind of where I get into user experience. I think that all matters a lot too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what what um, survey software do you use? Typically. Yeah, so I don't actually use any right now at the moment. Like I don't set up my own surveys, um, but mm -hmm. for a project I'm supporting, uh, we use Qualtrics. Um, and then when I was at RAND, which was so, I guess I'm like, it's so nice. They have a whole survey division. So they handle it, <laughs> you just like write it up in Word and send it to them. Um, and then they handle the rest and give you your data back. So uh, yeah, so they, they do their whole thing. I know for the class that we took um, actually in the survey design, the director of the center was like our instructor, um, but I still I still don't remember the survey. We just we typed it up in Word and sent it out to the good people, and then they <laughs> gave it back <laughs> a couple of weeks later. <laughs> okay, that's a good setup right there. Yeah. So um, after the after your doctoral doctoral classes courses mm -hmm. coursework, you were a instructional assistant at UCLA Executive Master. Masters of Health, Masters of Public Health program. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you come across this? And then I guess, what did you do? Yeah, so this one came about since I had been a TA when I was at UCLA for several, several years. Um, and I had built up a reputation. Um, the professor, I think it was, yeah, the professor, yeah, Dr. Lee, he asked, and um, had the, um, the leadership of the, um, the executive master's program reach out to me um, and ask if I would be interested in being um, the TA. And so, and I think also the, um, the person who did it uh, wasn't able to do it that quarter and she, you know, recommended me as well. So, um, so that was nice and I loved it. They met every other Friday. So I would like get on the bus and go from Santa Monica back to Westwood um, and go, you know, sit in for a part of the lecture and then go up and do the data portion of the course. So, uh, so I really love that gig, especially because, you know, those are, it was fun to see, okay, who's, who's coming, who's in this program. I think we had a dentist, we had somebody who flew down like from Sacramento every other week. Um, so it was really cool to, to be a part of the executive program. Okay. That's awesome. Was it as fun as uh, your math tutor position though? 
Hmm, great question. I don't know. The math tutoring, yeah. I'm like, didn't feel like a job. That's on a whole nother <laughs> that's on a whole nother planet almost. Um, yeah, no, not as fun, right? Because I think that's what you also I'm like I was in there with the other tutors, so you would just talk and catch up in between, you know, mm-hmm. sessions. So I there's no, yeah, I don't, there's almost no comparison. It was fun, but it wasn't that fun. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you were a teaching assistant for the faculty leaders program at Party Rand mm-hmm. Graduate School. So how do you get this and what do you do? Yeah, so for that program, we invited um, faculty members from all over and especially faculty who didn't actually have a policy background to get that training over the summer. And uh, it was me and a few other first year students I think we just got an email from the deans. They're like, hey, we think you might be a good fit for this. Would you be interested? Um, and the other thing about, you know, RAND is like a consultancy is you get like a project task number for every project that you're on. They're like, hey, we have a PTN for this. I'm like, okay, great. I'm there. <laughs> so, you know, it'll help cover your time mm-hmm. too. Um, but I was really excited. I actually got to meet um, a faculty member who was a Spelman alum. And so we're still connected. That was wonderful. Uh, to just get, you know, to be able to meet her. Uh, but we basically just helped them walk through because a lot of the curriculum they were doing was very similar to the first year curriculum that we had just gone through. Mm-hmm. So we essentially just supported them with kind of learning and um, understanding, you know, how to apply these methods that, um, you know, we knew from our policy training into their work. Uh, so yeah, that was a lot of fun. Just lots of discussions. You know, we did do the um, kind of support and feedback for their ideas as they were building them throughout the week. And then we also just had lunch and just different activities just to get to know people. Okay, that sounds cool. And then you were you were also a graduate teaching assistant at Party Run Graduate School. I was, <laughs> yeah, that was for our statistics courses. So yep, back in with Stata. Actually, we did R for one of them. So mm-hmm. I think Stata for one, R for another, uh, yeah. Yep, just doing my thing. <laughs> <laughs> which which uh, program language is your favorite or program software, oh, I should say? question. Well, I guess for statistical analysis, I would say R. Um, the tidyverse is just unmatched. I just, you know, it's it's powerful. So I would say that was, but I would say before that it was Stata, actually. I found it to be just pretty easy and intuitive. Um, and so I've done like a good bit of both. And then I would say outside of that, um, hmm, I love Tableau for data visualization, but there's times where I'm like really starting to enjoy Excel a lot more lately, um, especially for data visualization and trying new things like that. Um, Yeah, so those are my kind of my faves. (laughs) Yeah, that's cool. Definitely got to drop some more info about those uh, for us on on your IG page, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Definitely. So um, you are also an uh, assistant policy researcher at uh, Mm -hmm. RAN Corporation. So what do you do with this position? Yeah, so that was our title as uh, student researchers, essentially. So we had kind of a dual roles and doctoral student at the party RAN graduate school and then assistant policy researcher at RAN. Uh, and so we would, you know, get on to different projects by just kind of meeting with PIs and understanding which projects were getting ready to be funded and were they a good match for our skills. Uh, and so through that, I worked on and um, continued to actually work on a uh, community-based participatory research project that I had done in the past. So we kind of wrapped that up um, right before I started um, a program. And then um, just a few others, a lot of survey analysis. Um, so RAND has the American Life Survey like panel. And so that's actually where we fielded a lot of those surveys that we did. Um, So I was on that project for quite some time. And actually a really fun one uh, was called Be There San Diego. And that was uh, this really incredible group of, you know, clinicians, hospital um, systems, community partners, all working to improve cardiovascular health of the residents in San Diego County. And I got to do data visualization for that. And that was a blast. So uh, that was when I really beefed up my Tableau skills quite a bit. And I uh, got to you know, look at every zip code and see what the rates were for different quality measures. So uh, related to heart health. Um, so things like um, for people who had diabetes, you know, where was their like, blood pressure control, things like that. Um, so yeah, that was, those are some of my like favorite projects. And then actually one more that I really loved was um, called the healthiest cities and counties, and this was, um, you know, throughout the whole U.S. We actually got to just interview folks who had won these grants, and see what they were doing in their community to implement, you know, and improve 
health outcomes. And we help them with just understanding how to evaluate their programs. And then uh, we also were responsible for picking kind of the winner. Um, but it was really fun to basically go on this tour of the United States through these different phone calls to kind of see what they were doing. Um, so I really enjoyed that. I love the variety um, of work that I got to do. Yeah, that, that does sound like you had quite a variety at, at RAND and you had so many great experiences and probably made a lot of connections during that time as well. How, how big is the RAND uh, grad school? If, if you know, you don't have to know. Yeah, I'm saying not, not too big, right? Like I went to like a small HBCU and like a big <laughs> UC and then it was a really small program. I want to say there are about 120 of us. There are about like 20 students per cohort. Um, and then, you know, roughly people would graduate around somewhere around the four and a half year mark. Um, so yeah, something like that, like less than 150 students. Okay, no, that's cool. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for doing that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so quick then you were- Back at the envelope calculation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quick maths for you, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So you are a senior popular health population health analyst at uh, Capital Blue Cross. What is mm -hmm. Capital Blue Cross? Yeah, so it's an um, independent licensee of the Blue Shield and Blue Cross uh, yeah. Association, or Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. And so it's in uh, Pennsylvania. And it's actually really interesting because Pennsylvania has a few different um, blues plans. So there's Highmark, there's Independence Blue Cross, and there's Capital. And so they each kind of had their own zone. So Highmark was more like the Western Pennsylvania, and uh, we were central and then independence was in Philly. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the goal there and my role, it actually was very closely related to the Be There San Diego project. We were essentially looking at those heat is measures and so all those healthcare quality measures to see, you know, for all of our value-based programs, you know, how are they doing each month and where can we make improvements? And so I was responsible for running reports for certain um, like groups that we had and then looking at trends and coming up with kind of new ways that we could um, evaluate and try to understand, you know, what was driving these changes. Um, and again, it kind of came and it also brought in a little bit more of that information management. Like this was health information management, health information technology. You're getting these data from all of these health plans or these health, health systems mm -hmm. to the health plan um, about your members. And then you're kind of giving them back the results of saying, okay, well, for our members, you know, who are with your providers, here's how they're doing. And so we would meet, you know, um, monthly with the teams, you know, who are in charge of quality at all these different health systems, show them the reports and explain, you know, what the trends that we're seeing. Um, and then also just deal with different like data issues that would come up, right? Because all these systems, you know, you're thinking data goes through and it comes, comes to you you have to kind of think about that whole pathway and what might have happened to it in the middle or what happened when they made a software upgrade somewhere um, or when the, you know, different like lists and things change and references. So um, it's, it's incredible, just all the people, the team that you need to really trust that end product. Um, so that was really incredible just to get kind of pull back the curtain and see like, wow, what happens here, you know, like, for my project, when I was at uh, RAND, it was like, you just get that clean data set at the end because all the people at the health plan did their job. And now I'm the person at the health plan, like trying to make sure I do my job well so that we have accurate data going out each month. Okay. And which, which side of the equation did you enjoy more? Oh, I definitely love the data visualization. That was the best part uh, for me. Um, but, you know, also I think recognizing that there's so much teamwork that goes into it. Like, yes, I might make my great visualization, but we also have to trust our team all, all along the way. Um, so just like building those relationships, getting to know kind of who's in charge of what system and what are the different like timelines for updates and upgrades. It's so, there's so many moving pieces to it. Yeah. yeah so so uh, after your position, after this position, you were a subject matter expert for Essentials for Data Literacy course at Davidson College. So how did, how did this come about and what, what did you do? Yeah, so this was actually um, right at the same time as my work. So uh, it was a summer class and it was a four week class. So I was able to kind of fit it in with everything else. Um, but Shay is actually my Spelman sister, fellow math major and, you know, biostatistics. Um, she has her PhD in biostats and she was a professor at Davidson and she had this idea for this data literacy course and 
actually that's another thing like just kind of paying attention I was like data literacy like this sounds like it makes sense to me I've never heard it but this is basically what I do I just try to help help everyone orient themselves to you know what are we looking at what kinds of questions should we be asking when we're you know assessing a new data set why would we choose these set of colors versus that one for a data visualization you know what's our goal here uh, and so I, you know, she had talked to me about it actually a little over a year before we launched the course, uh, but she had the idea and just built it up. And I was so excited to partner with her on it. Um, it was a little different because it was going to be all online, but I guess that's everything. That was everything last year. <laughs> um, but we did the course through edX. And so I uh, essentially supported, you know, looking over all the materials, all the labs, um, the data sets, just checking that everything was in place and then responding to learner questions. So they would post screenshots and I would go and take the data set and kind of run my own and then put it, you know, put the response back. Um, and I did a couple office hour sessions as well, uh, which were really good. Uh, yeah, so it was it was different. It was like being a TA, but being a TA for a massive open online course was a very different experience, but it was a great one. I think uh, we had a lot of, you know, people were really excited and really grateful that the class was being offered and we focused on learning R, which I think people appreciated too. Okay, that, that is awesome. Um, were there any big challenges that you had during this time? Yeah, I would say the biggest challenge was just trying to connect with the students. Like, I think for me, it just felt like a challenge. I was like, what, you know, I'm just typing, like, welcome to the class. And you have the whole <laughs> discussion thread, but I'm like, I don't, I don't see people. And so we realized like, you know, part of the way through, we're like, let's actually just do the office hour session. So that's when we, we held them um, to just like have more of a touch point with people. I think it still worked out in terms of like the, you know, being able to provide support on the forum. But I'm, you know, and I'm still learning in this space, like what, what are good formats for online courses, especially these big ones? Um, we were running it live, but, you know, I know a lot of the times you sign up for an online course and you're just kind of going through the weeks and maybe you have a discussion board with another student, but you actually never get to see, see or speak to any of the instructors or, mm -hmm. or creators of the course. So, so I think that was a really important thing to add in. I think I would probably add that in earlier next time. It was just kind of learning as we went along. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And um, before we go into your next role, I wanted to ask, like, how much of your learning of our Stata and and what what other, whatever other programs was it from, like, coursework versus how much you did, like, on your own, just learning on your own? Yeah, I'd say most of it was either coursework or projects or tutoring. So um, I mentioned like the tidyverse in R and how exciting it is, but like two years ago, I had never touched it and it's been out for five years. Uh, so I had a student uh, who I was tutoring who was learning it. So she sent me her things and I was like, oh, let me, you know, let me figure this out before we meet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's basically what I did. Uh, that was when I wrote my first like deep higher pipe was getting ready for that session. Um, and so I think it also helped me realize too, it just about like creating more like self-directed learning goals, um, because it, it kind of been on my list of things I was interested in learning was like going more in depth with R. Um, but I think what I did, especially when I was at RAND was just pick some projects and they didn't really mind. They said, oh, sure, you can use R. So I did use R for a few. I used Tableau for a few, um, and just kind of got practice through that. And then several courses use data. So continue to practice there with that. Um, and then classes were also in SAS. So I would say also at UCLA in Biostat, we use just about everything for different courses. So, well, not everything. I, won't, I don't know if they're doing Python now, but we did R, SAS, and Stata um, for, for various classes. And so you kind of had to just know like, okay, what, what am I doing this quarter? This professor likes SAS. So let me make sure I have my SAS license ready to go. Um, or this one, we're using R for this class because we were doing like a special, like the random forest algorithm. And so... You know, I think if you want to do that in SAS, you have to pay for like this extra license on top of it. Um, but in R, it's open source. So that's what we did. Um, so yeah, I just practiced with courses and then chose for some projects. They, you know, had flexibility. Um, so I could choose my software and then for tutoring, you know, you go with whatever the student's working on and kind of just jump in wherever they're at. Yeah, that, that is awesome. So after this, you were the founder and consultant at Rose Data Studio LLC, which people can follow at Rose Data Studio on Instagram. So why did you want to start this? And what's the thought process behind it? 
Sure. I was a tutor, as I mentioned prior to this, and uh, I was on uh, wiseant.com. And so when you're there, you know, people are looking for tutors in different spaces. So you get all kinds of people with statistics, homework problems. Um, and it was fun for a while, but I guess, again, started to notice, you know, I looked at kind of all the clients I had worked with. I said, who were the most interesting and fun to work with? And it was actually women who were already in like health or healthcare wanting to like learn Tableau or learn a new tool, either to be better at their job or to like go for an interview. Um, and so the homework was nice and important, but those are really exciting. Um, and also working on projects with people. Uh, so I said, okay, well, if I wanna, you know, what if I just make my own platform and I can get like market to these exact kind of people and find them and they can find me um, versus the, you know, person who, you know, they're, they're always there and they, they need help too. But if you waited till like Friday to do a project that's due Saturday, I really don't want to No, <laughs> that's not my ideal client. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but you would get all kinds on, on wise ant. So I think that helped me just start to decide and say, okay, I've written my profile this kind of way, but I don't know if my clients are here. Maybe I need to go find them myself. And so, um, yeah, I just decided Rose data studio, uh, was going to be my thing and the even naming it I remember you know because you have to get your domain name and I was like <laughs> oh what am I going to choose and it's so interesting I chose Rose it's actually a family name and I actually like happen to love the flower too right but mm -hmm. um, and it's my daughter's middle name um, and so all those things kind of went into it I was like well that sounds nice like what's the rest of it and so I might I can't even, I don't remember if I have my notebook still of all the different iterations I, I considered um, but I thought about studio actually because I had been introduced to the idea of a design studio or like the architecture design studio, right? Where you're, you know, you have this idea, you put it up, you get feedback on it, then you take it down and you go rework it and then you put it up again and people get feedback. And so I just thought about that as like, that's my approach. My approach is to encourage, to get feedback, to critique and support. Um, so I just said, okay, this is a data studio. I'm like, it's the only one I know about, but it's going to be mine. And so that's, that's how Rose Data Studio was born. Yeah, that's awesome. And how, how long has it, has it been around? Yeah, it's been almost a year and a half. So in August, we celebrated one year. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. So did it, it started with, I'm guessing your website and then Instagram was a, a way for you to market? Yeah, yeah, it started, I guess, yeah, Instagram, my Facebook page, and then um, my website. Yep. Yeah, I remember just like that moment of buying the domain name. I was like so excited. And actually, it's funny, I actually tried to buy a cool domain name, but then certain websites don't recognize it. So I was trying to at first be rosedata.studio because I thought that would mm. be really great. Mm -hmm. But yeah, most some, you know, when you're signing up for emails or things, they'll be like, that's not a recognized okay. email. And I'm like, mm -hmm. You guys are not on my level. <laughs> not, like, yes, yes, it is. So I'm actually glad I bought both domain names. And then I took time. <laughs> I took time last summer to switch it over to rosedatastudio.com officially. Okay. Um, since the internet was not ready for, for that <laughs> studio yet. <laughs> uh, that, that's a good, good little lesson to learn there, though. With yeah. that, it's cool that there's a dot studio, though. I, I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. Um, but at least. I at least you got to switch it over to, to .com. Uh, so what, what services do you offer specifically? Yeah, so I offer data coaching and that essentially is um, a little bit different than tutoring. So I think of data coaching as supporting people through applying their still skills to projects um, and building those things that are going to go into their portfolio to show people that you know these are the skills that I have, here's what I can do with it. Um, and so that it's it, in the coaching part also takes the form of, you know, um, data visualization. So giving feedback on presentations. I've done a few um, dissertation um, presentation support as well as interview presentations. Those are my favorite. I think just, you know, having that outsider perspective of, you know, yes, I can understand the data, but I didn't do this for you or with you. Mm -hmm. um, how can we convey this as clearly as possible? So I love like workshopping. And I think that's where the idea of the data studio kind of comes in. Um, so I'd say that's kind of my first, um, like one of my main 
uh, services that I offer. And then of course there is the tutoring, right? There are students who are enrolled either in graduate programs or in certificates or in Coursera courses or edX courses, where again, you don't have that TA or that support. Um, so I offer that. Um, and as a longtime TA, I think it's just one of my kind of favorite roles to play is to offer that support to people as they're going through. Um, and then I think having jumped into so many different projects at different places and working with so many students like on Wiseant who are taking, you know, either statistics for business or political science or, you know, biology, like literally the, the biostatistics, statistics in biology courses and for biological sciences. Um, I'm just able to understand different data contexts um, and just help help people, you know, make it to the, the next steps and put those dots together so that they can, you know, get through. Um, and so the new thing I'm really excited about this year is that I'm doing workshops. And so for that, I'm working with schools of public health and their career services centers to, you know, figure out what kind of data professional development would be, you know, ideal for their students. Um, so I'm really excited to do that. And I guess I've been teaching online this whole time. So we're just going to keep doing that. COVID has made that, you know, con to continue to be a thing. So mm -hmm. Um, so we'll do that as well. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing to, you know, do the training and coaching. And I've started doing more online courses as well. Um, one I have is called Preparing for Success in Biostatistics. And it's just kind of like all the thoughts and ideas I have around taking, you know, again, taking everything you're learning in biostat and just starting to think more like an analyst. Um, and just putting, you know, again, putting it out there, um, go even, even putting it on LinkedIn, you're like, hey, I, I use dplyr functions for the first time, like post that I want to see it, right. So I think we, I think too, we, you know, we learn from all these incredibly talented biostatisticians. And sometimes we're like, oh, does anybody want to see like this bar chart I made? I'm like, yes, I do want to see it. <laughs> like, I think we all have to grow, we have to grow our own and we have to own you know, whatever skill set we have um, and keep cultivating it and be proud of it. Um, so that's, that's really what I focus on. Um, and I really enjoy it. And so I think I'm glad I picked Rose Data Studio as a name. I think it all kind of fits. We're just all here, you know, kind of working together to keep sharpening our skills and, um, you know, really bringing more clarity to these public health issues that, you know, we're passionate about. Um, and then just helping them, you know, helping, helping it be very clear to decision makers and others like, hey, what should we do next? How should we approach this? How should we collect the data? Um, so really that whole process of applying like all the data literacy concepts um, to, to these public health issues that we care so much about. Yeah, yeah, that that is awesome, and I'm glad that you said uh, tell people just to share what they they have on like LinkedIn and whatnot. I feel like that that's so undervalued, and yeah. I think it is so undervalued because we always look up to people, but we never think about the people that are looking up to us, and and I feel like we have so much value to give to people even when we don't know it. And I think just share and don't think about it. Just share and just continue to share, and because yep. that's that's what I did basically, and look where I am right now. So. Absolutely. Yeah, so that, thank you for saying that. Um, so how, how do you get clients? How, how did you get the uh, schools of public health? Did, did they reach out to you? Did you reach out to them? Yeah, so I'm actually starting with my own school of public health. So okay. uh, we're kind of in the, in the talks right now about you know, putting the workshop together. Um, and so I think kind of the way you would work to get any clients, right? Like you do a great job with one, you get the testimonial and then you kind of take it out to the, the next one. So, um, so I think that's gonna be the process um, there. And yeah, I do know, you know, I think I would talk to, you know, students who are already in different programs and, you know, about some of the professional development they've had and just figure out who the point of contact is. I know there's also ways to, you know, even on through LinkedIn, right, start posting about it. And maybe that will attract others. Um, so we'll see. Um, but I'm excited to kind of go through the process. I'd say for clients that I work with more one on one or in the group coaching that I'm going to be offering soon. Um, mostly it's like when they come to my website, the website is mainly tailored for them. Um, I think I'm going to start creating different landing pages for different clients. I actually got that idea from Latanya Bynum. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great approach um, to really making my website work more for me. Um, so I'm excited to keep growing and developing like these different streams. Um, and then for courses as well. Yep. I like promote on um, Instagram or through my um email list. So, you know, I have kind of an opt-in when you go to download like some of my free resources as well. Uh, so yeah, just going to kind of keep exploring different options and trying different things. 
um, to see kind of what, what, what works well. Um, but I think the other thing that's really nice is once I get clients, you know, who are working with me, we tend to work together for, you know, quite a, either a couple of weeks to get through a class or a couple of months if they're preparing for interview or like working on a series of courses. Um, so it's, I think for me, it's definitely about like the depth of our relationship um, and really what all we're able to accomplish. So it's been a lot of fun to, you know, to see how far people can go and how much work we can do together um, and just how much they grow over time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what, um, what sorts of free resources do you have on your website? Yeah, so I have a few right now. So I have a list of resources for data analysis and public health. And mm-hmm. it's a one pager with a breakdown of you know, different software programs. So by like SAS, Tableau, um, Stata, I have SPSS on there, um, as well as it's an introduction to biostatistics. I also have SQL or SQL because that's really important with when working with big data sets. Uh, and so it's just uh, separated by, you know, courses, books, and then kind of resources, which, which would be things like cheat sheets. Um, I would say the R cheat, 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 cheat sheets are very nice. And then the Stata ones, I used those a ton when I was in grad school. Um, but I actually compiled this list uh, by just kind of asking people, you know, which things did you like, what worked well for you, and then adding some of my own favorites. Um, there. So I think it's a good starting place. And then the second um, resource I have is called Clear Goals for um, Advancing Your Data Skills. And so this workbook, it actually includes a link, you know, to the resource sheet, but it helps you actually go through a process of setting, you know, measurable goals for the data skills that you want to learn. What I see a lot of people saying is, you know, I need to be better in SAS or I need to learn R. I'm like, what part of it? Like, there's so Mm -hmm. much to learn. Like, let's, let's like hone in on, you know, the packages or the type of output that you want to create. And then I also have some data sets listed there and places you can go to like start practicing. Um, But I think first, you know, because the world is so vast, yes, we're in the world of big data. We're in the world of so many courses out there and so many trainings. Um, I think it's really helpful to be able to evaluate, you know, what, what do you need to get from this one or what do you need to get for whichever one you're looking for? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any advice for new consultants? Yeah, I think it sounds, I'm like, it almost sounds corny now. I know everyone says this, but like, know who your (laughs) ideal client is, right? (laughs) And, And how to speak with them. And I think I guess the knowing can come from, again, like sampling and trying out different things, which is also something that, you know, I've done um, and just kind of continued to to shape my messaging and really focus it more over time. Um, I think I, at first I was like, oh, I should just do, I did some SPSS, so I should just keep doing it. And I'm like, no, actually, I don't want to focus on SPSS right now, um, just because I don't want to have to hold that syntax in my head along with R and Stata and SAS, as well mm-hmm. as Tableau and Excel, I think I'm, you know, I think I'm okay, right? And I think there's other SPSS people I can recommend folks to. Um, and then Python, I, I said I was going to try to learn Python last year, and that did not happen. And it doesn't have to, right? Like, I could make a clear goal about that, but I have so many other ones that are higher priority for me. And so I think it's just having those delineations so that when people come to you, and I did, I had a client, and I told her, you know, I'm not as strong in Python. Um, so I could give her like frameworks for coding, but like some of the nitty gritty of like just you know, just Python isms. I was like, I don't know. So mm-hmm. one of my colleagues, I like sent her there. I was like, hey, go here. And then when you're ready to do something else, come back and we can keep working together. And so I think that that's the other part too, just having a great network of other consultants so that, you know, you know what your greatest strengths are and you know what their strengths are and you can, you know, work together to help serve everyone who kind of comes into your ecosystem. Yeah. And do you work at Rose Data Studio alone or do you have any help? Yeah, right now I'm alone, but I am getting ready to hire some assistants. So I'm looking for an intern or VA, and I'm really excited about that. Um, You know, they talk about you get to this point where you're, you know, you want to spend more time on just like the development of the business instead of the administrative tasks, right? Because there's always emails to look at. And so um, (laughs) just being able to divide that labor, I think it's going to make me so much more efficient. So I'm really excited. 
Yeah, yeah. right now it's just me and like the automation software that I do have is helping me out right now. <laughs> okay. And so, so tell me about the progression of the business then. So from, mm -hmm. from starting to like, did you start with all these different ideas? Cause I know you're doing a couple different things with the business or was yeah. it like one idea and then from there it grew into different things and how, how did that work out? Yeah. So first I started with a focus on um, just tutoring for people who are already in biostatistics courses. And so that actually is kind of another thing. So I'm calling it Biostats and Thrive, which is I'm turning it into more of like a coaching and kind of mentoring program now instead of, of just the tutoring. Like it goes, I think for me, it, it always goes just beyond um, the, the work, right? And the problem set that we're doing. Um, so, but I, I started out with focusing on people who were enrolled in Biostat, and then I also had this focus on interview preparation and job readiness for people who were, you know, had their MPH or some other graduate degree, and were recognizing that the job they wanted to apply for were requiring more skills of them. Um, and so those kind of became two, basically two types of clients that I'd serve. And then I would say now looking at, you know, working with the schools of public health themselves, um, sometimes even their alumni might be interested in, you know, participating in a workshop. So you're still, I'm still kind of serving those two groups, but just through, you know, that shared connection of their graduate program. Um, so yeah, it's just, um, I guess, kind of holding all these different configurations in my head and kind of seeing what works. I'm looking forward um, in this year to moving toward more group coaching. So basically putting all my trainings together um, and having, you know, kind of a progression that you work through doing, you know, working sessions together, Q&A and coaching calls, and then also offering feedback um, when people can send in kind of the screenshots again, right? Like we did this summer, send in your screenshots um, and I'll get feedback. So I'm now just kind of putting it all together. And I think even with that, I might have coaches and other like colleagues who have the biostat background to, to support me with like different elements of that. So maybe some of the giving feedback, it's like, hey, you'll get a biostatistician who's PhD trained mm -hmm. to, you know, get feedback on your work. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm excited to, to put it all together. And I think it's, it's fun. And I love just being encouraging to people. I think think it's it I think that's kind of at the end of the day really what they're looking for they're looking for a safe place to be able to work out the problems mm -hmm. um, as well as you know figure out and like you know there's hope yes work through the problems and also know that you know everyone's a work in progress to some degree um, so I think the more that I can you know just get the support I need um, to be able to work effectively the better I'll be able to serve others yeah, that's, that is awesome. And uh, I definitely think that it is going to grow. And I'm definitely going to send anyone who has any kind of data needs or wants straight to you. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I look, I, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, of course, God, I feel like you just need to give value to people and you're giving value to people in a, in a very great way. So I'm happy to see it. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, also you are a research associate at Pharmacy Quality Alliance. So mm -hmm. how did you get this job and what do you do in it? Yeah, so I actually got this job. Um, we we're getting ready to move. You know, the pandemic changed a lot of things. So mm -hmm. it was just time for us to go. And so we said, okay, we're moving. And I told one of my friends, uh, she actually is, um, you know, college advisor for, for undergrads. And she saw a job. She looks at, you know, public health boards. And so she found a job that, that they needed at least a master. So she said, oh, this is for you. <laughs> so she <laughs> sent it my way. I applied and there, there, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Awesome. So wow, what do you do in this role? Yes, yeah, so I support a range of research projects, um, kind of, and I guess similarly to Rand, we had some kind of like, um, you know, more like bigger, like grant sponsored work and then smaller, um, or I wouldn't say smaller, but just like more like community-based kind of outreach work. So I support like different types of projects that we do. Mm -hmm. um, I do statistical analysis and data visualization as well um, for all of those. So, yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. And how, how do you balance both this job and uh, Rose Data Studio? Um, yeah, so, so how do I balance both? So I meet with clients for a very like set and limited number of hours per week. And then I dedicate Saturday mornings to like administrative time. So I already have the things I need, the forms I need to fill out, you know, for the Saturday. Uh, and then automation. So one of the first things I think I got when I got my domain name was like upgraded my Calendly and upgraded my Zoom so that they could just work together and automatically schedule people for me. Um, and then forms as well. So just having like, you know, 
forms go out and reminders go out to people for like invoices and other things so that I don't have to always like remember to you know, send that out. Um, so I would say that those things have saved me time. And then I think the next level of time saving will be having, you know, an intern or someone else on my team um, to support me as well. Okay. Yeah, that is definitely awesome. And I, I look forward to seeing that growth. Uh, yeah. uh, so where would you like to see yourself in the future? That's a great question. You know, I think about it all the time. It's funny because it changes. It changes mm -hmm. so much. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I could see myself in a variety of settings. So in, like in one, on one hand, I could see myself, you know, doing the data coaching full time and, you know, offering trainings and doing the groups. Um, then at the same time, I could also see myself like in the role of like a user experience researcher. I think that is just such a cool way to combine like the social science research methods and apply it to like the tech world and all these other settings that we have. Um, so yeah, we, we will see. I just, you know, I read and kind of just keep exploring, um, every day. So who knows? We'll see. Or maybe I'll go back and get the PhD. Like I said, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I look forward to seeing the, what you do decide to do. And I, I know either way it's going to be great. So I just look forward to, well, I look forward to continuing this, uh, connection, this relationship and, uh, look forward to seeing where, where it all goes. Thank you. So, yeah, you're most welcome. So moving on to the furious five, the, uh, the five questions I ask all the guests, mm -hmm. um, Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Yeah, I would say look at who you really admire in the field, um, kind of find your role models. And even if you can't actually talk to them, right, just see what they did in their path and the things that you want to emulate. Um, and then just start finding, figuring out ways to, to get those experiences and then you say yes, no, pivot and figure out, you know, what to explore next. Awesome. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Mm -hmm. yeah, great question. I would say kind of just the experimenting still, right? So if it's um, about like running a, your own consultancy, so how can you do a sample project for someone um, in, you know, in that same realm? And then in terms of like the data skills, um, I would say, again, building your own projects, um, there's all kinds of cool like shiny dashboards and R. I haven't even done, I've done a few practice ones, but you know, just again, building it, trying it out. Um, I'm always really inspired by um, like computer scientists, like web developers, and um, they'll do like a hundred days of code and show the different apps that they're making. So again, mm -hmm. just, just put it out there and keep going and, and just go through that learning process um, and just kind of build up, right? Keep going from the small steps to the bigger ones. Awesome. Number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? Yeah, I am working on improving my working out. So like I mentioned, I used to go for yoga. Um, it was so nice. It was so, I just miss yoga studios right now. Um, so I have on my Fitbit, I do uh, walking <laughs> workouts at home. Um, and I've been doing like some Pilates as well. So I just try to try different videos out, but I really love being around people for that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been tough. It's been a tough thing during the pandemic. So I'm trying to kind of do my, you know, my pandemic workouts and then we'll get back to that one day. Awesome. Well, I hope that you are able to get back to your yoga and everything else soon. Um, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Yeah, so... I would say book wise, well, I guess I, I get all my books mostly, mo the majority of the books I get from the library. So I have the Libby app and I just download them. Um, so I would recommend just, you know, reading a book that's not related exactly to what you do, you're doing, you um, doing, maybe once a month or once every other month, um, something that can help you make new connections. Um, the one I'm reading right now is actually about Scrum and that like methodology. Um, and it's been really it just so, so helpful for me to think, you know, yes, I'm not a software developer, but if I was like, or if I was to take this idea and apply it to my life, like which elements would make the most sense. Um, so it's just, again, like I'm kind of like that divergent thinking and thinking what can other, you know, like industries teach you, or even just a great fiction novel. Um, so I started reading one, um, I can't remember the title now. But I started reading it right before the break, which tells you I haven't been back to it in a minute, um, <laughs> but I need to finish it. Um, but it, it was just about this, like these kids, these, um, 
I don't know, you probably want to cut this part. I can't even remember, but <laughs> <laughs> I heard to say Libby books. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think that's an underutilized resource too, is local libraries. Yeah. I feel like they have so many books, so many resources like Libby and stuff now. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely. And uh, last but not least, where can people connect with you? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm on Instagram at Rose Data Studio, uh, as well as on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, so you could just look up Asia Spears, um, whole, I guess the whole profile file is you know linkedin.com slash in slash asia j okay awesome yeah well, well thank you so much asia for, for taking the time to be on the podcast tonight i appreciate you sharing your insights and i definitely know some data people are going to come your way so uh yeah. thank you <laughs> thank you so much for having me yeah my pleasure well, I'm glad to have Asia on today. Rose Data Studios is doing some great things, really just helping students, helping people understand biostats and how they can better leverage that, how they can do their different things. And I think her story is just quite fascinating. And I'm, I'm just glad that I got to interview her here. So you all be sure to follow her on Instagram at Rose Data Studio and uh, definitely just tune in next week. And I look forward to sharing more public health stories with you all. If you have not as yet, definitely subscribe, review, leave a like, leave a comment, share this with a friend, with your mom, anyone. Um, really appreciate you all. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your week. Public App Millennial out.